Chapter 12 Feathered Fury Hey you, Mudcouch shouted hilariously. Guess that'll teach you to leave my chickens, Ralphs be. Oh, Pop, Jed shrieked. Ain't he funny? He almost sat down on the white rock rooster. The river ain't wet, is it? mocked Jenny. Gus Comstock stood up in the shallow water, spurtingly angrily. He shook his fist at the group on shore. You'll pay for this, he warned, while Jed rounded up the few chickens which had escaped from the wire enclosure on the raft. Mudcat Joe tied up Tig so that Gus Comstock could wade ashore. More outraged than hurt, the man retreated to his car, breathing threats at every step. Even the exhaust of his automobile sounded angry as he drove off down the highway. That surely was funny, Louise chuckled. It served Mr. Comstock right, too. He had no business trying to cut loose the raft. Maybe we ought to have Stick the dog on him, Mudcat said meditatively. If that feller does own this shed, I reckon we'll pay a plenty for the fun of getting rid of him. Well, landlords do have a way of ousting tenants, sometimes, Penny agreed. He probably will be back. Oh, he'll be back, all right, said Joe gloomily. And I got a feeling he'll be a bringing the sheriff along with him. What will you do then, asked Louise. I don't know, replied Joe gloomily. If I could find the River Queen, we'd just climb aboard and wash our hands of this here upstart. But the river man had no houseboat about here, as lost as a duck in a desert, am I? Well, if Mr. Comstock makes trouble for you, I may be able to do something about it, Penny promised. If he puts you out of the shed, we'll try to find you another place. That's mighty kind of you, Mudcat said with a sigh. But I reckon Jenny and me and the kids won't be able to be satisfied living on land. We can only feel at home on the river. Penny and Louise bade the family farewell and drove on to the ward's White Falls. Although they had been innocent bystanders at the little scene by the river, they were dubious as to the reception Gus Comstock would accord them when they reached the old mansion. I wonder if he really does own that shed, Penny mused. I suppose he must, or he wouldn't have created such a disturbance. How silly to get so excited over a deserted shack. The gates weren't doing the place any particular harm. Gus Comstock just has meanness in his blood, declared Penny. Presently, Entering the sleepy village of White Falls, the girls drew up in front of the old mansion. The upstairs blinds had been left drawn, and there was no sign of activity about the place. However, Gus Comstock's battered car stood on the street, so they knew that he had arrived ahead of them. Walking up to the front door, Penny and Louise rang the bell. It seemed that the girls' arrival had been noted from within, for almost instantly the door was flung open. Mrs. Comstock confronted them, her eyes blazing wrathfully. You're not wanted here, she said harshly. Go away and mind you don't come back. She started to close the door, but Penny deliberately blocked it with her foot. Really, we had nothing to do with your husband's unfortunate accident, the girl said. Please, may we see Laura for just a moment? No, you can't. What right do you have to refuse, Penny demanded indignantly. Mrs. Comstock's answer was to slam shut the door, barely missing Penny's foot. Ring again, Louise advised. Hold your finger on the bell until she comes. No, that would only get Laura into added difficulties. It's not right that she has to work in such a place. I agree with you, Louise said. If only we could talk with her, we might induce her to return to Riverview with us. Something has gone wrong, said Penny meditatively. I doubt that we would have been welcome even if Mr. Comstock hadn't fallen into the river. Laura knows something, and the Comstocks are afraid she'll tell. If you believe that, Penny, let's see her even if we have to break down the house. We might try the rear door, Penny suggested. They moved quickly around to the back entrance. The kitchen door was closed. You might lift up 
so that I can peek into the window, Penny said. If Laura is there, I'll signal her. Louise obligingly raised her chum, but in a moment Penny again dropped to the ground. The kitchen is deserted, she reported. What do you suppose became of Laura? Louise demanded anxiously. I'm beginning to feel uneasy, Penny confessed. It was strange the way she broke off in midst of our conversation. Yes, and all the talk about mysterious disappearances from room 7, Louise added. Wouldn't it be dreadful if anything has happened to Laura? It would be our fault for bringing her here. Don't say such a thing, Lou. Laura must be all right. I don't feel like returning home unless we're certain of it. No, neither am I. Suppose we talk with Lem Barr. The cafe owner was busy refilling the coffee urn when the girls entered his establishment. They sat down on high stools up by the counter and, as a pretext for their presence, ordered two pieces of pineapple pie. Getting to the regular callers in our town, aren't you? he inquired. We came to see our friend next door, Penny explained. Only Mrs. Comstock wouldn't let us talk to her. You don't say. Reckon maybe she's a mite upset this morning. Upset? Penny inquired alertly. About what, may I ask? Well, said Len Barr, vigorously polishing the coffee urn. I wouldn't know, but folks say things have been happening in that house. You mean the disappearance? Yes, I reckon maybe Mrs. Comstock is worried for fear the police may come around and ask a few questions. Why don't you report the matter, Mr. Varn? Not me. It's none of my business. Anyway, I ain't sure that anything happened. Things just look queer. Penny took a bite of the pie, studying the cafe owner's reflection in the mirror behind the soda fountain. Mr. Varr, she said, I don't suppose you noticed a car drive up to the mansion yesterday. Gray one, wasn't it? I imagine so, responded Penny. Mr. Harmon, an acquaintance of my father's, came here to see the Comstocks. He wore a brown suit. Sure, that was the fellow, the cafe man nodded. I saw him go into the mansion, but I never did see him come out. You don't mean something happened to him, Penny gasped. No, I'm not saying anything like that, Mr. Varn, amended hastily. For all I know, he may have driven off during the night. His car sat out in front till around midnight, and it was gone this morning when I opened up the restaurant. The man may have, may have left town early. Yes, reckon that's what happened, Mr. Varry agreed. He seemed reluctant to answer any more questions, but the girls would not leave until they had inquired about Laura. Their minds were greatly relieved when Lem Varr declared that he had seen the girl hanging up a a washing not an hour before their arrival. Then I guess nothing too dreadful has happened, Penny commented, as she and Louise were outside the cafe. As far as Mr. Hammond is concerned, I don't know what to think. Lem Barr distrusts the Comstocks, so I judge he's apt to jump to conclusion. Louise replied, he certainly was hinting that Mr. Harmon had disappeared mysteriously. I thought so at first, and then he denied it. I really believe we can't go much by what Mr. Varn does say. We might drop into the laundry and ask Sing Lee a few questions. No, that fellow gives me the creeps, Penny answered. I doubt that he would know anything, and if he did, he'd not be likely to tell us. The girls walked slowly back to their car, uncertain as to their next move. So far, they had obtained no trustworthy information regarding Mr. Harmon, and they were unwilling to return home without at least seeing Laura. Chancing to glance towards the upstairs window of the mansion, Penny suddenly gripped Louise's hand. There she is now, Lou. Laura could be seen standing by the window of her room, half hidden by a curtain. She was frantically signaling her friends. What is she trying to tell us? Louise questioned in bewilderment. She may mean for us to wait, Penny said hopefully. I do believe she intends to slip out of the house and meet us. Do, 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 do.